And I want to preach on or talk this morning about when mercy doesn't look like mercy. And so I don't know. Um, I just happened to write a little poem. And I've storied because I said I wasn't going to read them again. But probably not the first time I've storied. So, When mercy doesn't look like mercy... When mercy doesn't look like mercy, I question and I ask the Lord why. He gently reminds me of the great price he paid so I could draw nigh. But Lord, why all the troubles and heartaches, the distresses, the pain and the woe? He replies, so you will reach out to me and learn to lean on me, don't you know? Could it be the troubles we experience are really mercies on a mission After all, God loves us way too much to leave us in our present condition. He allows things to happen that may not be pleasant for us to go through. Our unpleasant circumstances are agents of mercy in disguise, though we don't have a clue. The Father in heaven is so full of grace and mercy for us all. His word tells us so. He wants the world to know his love and experience his river of mercy that does flow. This river of grace and mercy has been flowing from the dawn of time. Adam and Eve experienced the taste of mercy when they failed God and crossed the line. David knew this mercy firsthand as he wrote about it in the Psalms for all to hear. Psalm 51 is a portrait of this undeserved, unearned mercy that allowed him to draw near. It was this mercy that allowed a sinful David to come back to God and not be cast aside. This is almost too much to fathom, such mercy who can begin to describe. We have our own version of mercy should look like and what it should entail. We like to think of it as something gentle and kind, like a peaceful wind blowing a sail. We like to think of tender mercy as a cool breeze coming to refresh us on a scorching day. We like to think of great mercies on our own terms and in our own special way. But could tender mercies be so different than what we envision them to be? Could they possibly be the hardships we face that cause us to fall on our knee? That which seems so tragic and brings such a grief causes us to stop and reflect. Have we been so busy living lives so full that the most important things we neglect? We have a Father in heaven whose one desire is for us to love him with all of our heart. If we would just take the initiative on our own to do so... That would be our part. But because we get busy and allow stuff and things to be so important in our life, the Father says, I'll get their attention with a little heartache, possibly a little strife. Then when the trouble comes knocking and finds its way to our front door, we seem to have the time then to do what we should have done before. Life lived outside of his presence is really no life at all, as we would all agree. That's why we must daily come into the throne room where his mercy flows so free. So the next time you find yourself with trouble and heartache far more than your share, look at it with a different set of eyes and see the Father's great love and care. We must remember everything he allows to happen and come our way is an opportunity for us to grow and experience fresh new mercies with each new day. Mercies are new and mercies are fresh, new mercies we need for each passing day. These mercies we find with each sunrise when we take the time to stop and pray. Mercies are supplied and mercies are granted when on his name we call. How many times have tender mercies picked me up after I have had a fall? Tender mercies are fresh and new from the Father's heart full of love and compassion. Although there are times when they are packaged in a totally different fashion. Whatever means he's choosing to bring us to him in complete surrender... Just remember, this is always an act of mercy, even to the worst offender. I didn't mean you guys were not living like you were supposed to be living. Uh, But the thought of what we're going to talk about, I didn't realize you had gone through that. When mercy doesn't look like mercy, I want us to look at 2 Chronicles chapter 15. 2 Chronicles chapter 15 and verse 1. I want to focus on verse 1 through 8. I'll read a little bit more. Uh, This could actually be an eight-week series. Uh, Each one of these verses is a message all its own, but we're going to do an eight-week series this morning, so don't be afraid of that. 
we will have you out of here and in time to get to catch them before they eat all that good food up there. When mercy doesn't look like mercy, 2 Chronicles 15 and 1. Now the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Obed, and he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Wow, that's quite a statement to make. For a long time, Israel has been without the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. But when in their trouble they turned to the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found by them. And in those, day, those times there was no peace to the one who went out nor to the one who came in. But great turmoil was on all the inhabitants of the lands. So nation was destroyed by nation and city by city for God troubled them with adversity. Wow. I thought God only blessed. But you, be strong, and do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. And when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Obed, the prophet, he took courage. He removed the abominable idols from all the land of Judah and Benjamin, and from the cities which he had taken in the mountains of Ephraim, and he restored the altar of the Lord that was before the vestibule of the Lord. It took Asa hearing one word from the Holy Spirit coming on a prophet and speaking for Asa to begin reforms that caused a revival, so to speak, in Israel in that day. What does that tell me? It takes one person. It takes the Spirit of God moving on one person to enact change. It's never been the multitude, it's never been the masses, it's been the minority, and it takes the Spirit of God moving on one individual to create something great in the kingdom. That is what happened right here. Then he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and those who dwelt with them from Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon, for they came over to him in, a great, in great numbers from Israel when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. So they gathered together at Jerusalem in the third month, in the fifteenth year of the reign of Asa. <coughs> Excuse me. And they offered to the Lord at that time 700 bulls and 7,000 sheep from the spoil that they had brought. Aren't you glad we don't kill sheep for sacrifices and worship anymore? I would be barfing all over the place. I cannot stand the smell of blood or the sight of blood. I'd be passed out in the corner and somebody would have to give my offering for me. Then they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul. And whoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel was to be put to death. (laughs) Woo, you talk on about being faithful to prayer meeting. (laughs) That'll get you here. (laughs) Who's not here today? Send the party after them. Chop their head off. (laughs) I believe I'd be committed. (laughs) That's interesting. Whether small or great, whether man or woman, then they took an oath before the Lord with a loud voice, with shouting and trumpets and ram's horns. And all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart and sought him with all their soul, and he was found by them, and the Lord gave them rest all around. Wow, when they sought him, he was found. Also, he moved, uh, this is an interesting verse to me, and I'm sure I'm not pronouncing this poor woman's name correctly. I looked it up online to know how to say it, but they say it so weird I couldn't even say it how they said it. And also, we we'll call her Maka, Macha, Makakalaka, whoever she is. The mother of Asa, some translations say she's grandmother, from being queen mother. He even dethroned his kinfolk. He threw her off the throne, said, no, 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 you've not been living right. You've not been doing right. Because she had made an obscene image of Asherah. I would tell you what that image was. It was a male body part that she had made. You talk on about a a sick, sordid religion that they worshipped. She'd made this image of Asherah, and Asa cut down her obscene image, then crushed it and burned it by the brook Kidron. And he said, Mama, you don't have a throne to sit on anymore. 
Interesting, interesting little story. When mercy doesn't look like mercy. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy today. And it comes in different forms and in different fashions to our lives. And we praise you for your presence and your Holy Spirit in this house. Touch us, minister to us, open our hearts, and do what only you can do. I just want to break down these verses. And I can tell Wilton Crawford is not here, and he did not put this up here because I don't have a bottle of water. Thank you. (laughs) My throat is getting dry. And there's nothing worse than a dry preacher. (laughs) Believe you me, because I said, well, (laughs) I don't need to tell that one. That's too close to home. I just want to break these verses down. Verse 1, the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Obed. We know nothing of this particular prophet except what is written right here. And I just begin to think, heaven is going to be filled with the unknowns. <laughs> heaven is going to be filled with people who never had their name in big lights, never had a pat on the back, never were uh, you know, congratulated or had all the accolades. We don't know anything about this guy, but other than the Spirit of God came upon him at this point in time, and he had a word from the Lord, and he went and spoke it to Asa, and it so resonated with Asa's heart that he began making spiritual reforms, and it caused a great reformation at that time in Israel, in Judah. The Spirit of God came upon him. Dear Lord, how we need the Spirit to come upon us. Upon our worship, upon our preaching, upon our lives, upon our going to Walmart, upon our going to the Piggly Wiggly, upon our getting up, upon our sitting down, we need to be clothed with the Holy Spirit, whatever we do. When the Spirit of God comes, it doesn't matter if it's a hymn or a chorus or a kumbaya. When the Spirit of God crowns the service, it is just worship to Jesus Christ the King. How we need the Holy Spirit to come upon us in this hour. Individually, as a churches are assembling together upon everything we do, upon everything we attempt, supernatural things happen when the Spirit of God shows up. A woman who cannot walk gets up out of her wheelchair when the Spirit of God shows up. A person who is blind, when the Spirit of God comes upon them, they see things they've never seen before. How we need the Holy Spirit. The book of Judges gives account after account of God raising up people who would put his spirit upon them and deliver his people. Because you know the book of Judges is one of the saddest books in the Old Testament. It is so depressing. It is so, <laughs> it is so real to life. People, they would serve, they would backslide, they would get into apostasy, they would rebel. The cycle was just continuous. It just kept going in that repeated cycle. Serve God, fall away from God, worship idols, Fall on our face, God comes back and rescues us. We worship the Lord for a little bit, then we fall aside, then we worship our idols, we get away from God, God rejects us, we fall on our face, beg for mercy, God comes back. You ever read Judges? But even in those repeated cycles of rebellion, apostasy, and turning back from the Lord, God would raise up people that His Holy Spirit would come on. Judges 3, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and Asherahs. Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan Reshtham. I probably didn't do him justice either. King of Mesopotamia and the children of Israel served Cushan eight years. When the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the children of Israel who delivered them, Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. There is just something about God cannot overlook a cry. Did you hear me this morning? I don't care how far they've rebelled. (laughs) I don't care how many times they have rebelled. Read the story in Judges. It is a repeated cycle over and over and over again. They fall away from God. And the moment they fall on their face in repentance, God, help us. God, we've forsaken you. What does God do? Bam, he shows up. He gives us what we don't deserve. 
He cannot ignore a cry. Verse 10, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord delivered Cushan, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed over Cushan. Why? Because the Spirit of God came upon him. The Spirit of God came down and empowered him and enabled him to do what he could not do with his natural ability. Judges 6, 34. Gideon, shy, timid, scared, afraid Gideon, but the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Then he blew the trumpet and the Aborizites gathered behind him and he defeated the Midianites. Why? Because the Spirit of God came down and the Spirit of God gave the victory. Judges eleven twenty nine. 29, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh, passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he advanced toward the people of Ammon. You go on and read the rest of that, it says he defeated the Ammonites and he destroyed 20 cities. <laughs> How did a man do that? Because the Spirit of God came upon him. The Spirit of God clothed him. Judges 13, 24. The woman bare a son, called his name Samson, and the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move upon him at Manau, Dan, between Zorah and Eshtaol. Go down to verse, uh, uh, chapter 14 and verse 6. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. He tore the lion apart as one would have torn apart a young goat. Then he had nothing in his hand, but he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. The Spirit of God coming upon these people caused these people to do great and mighty things for the Lord what are the takeaway from the book of Judges and the spirit of God coming again it's one of the saddest books in the Old Testament the people are not serving Jehovah God they're serving idols the rebellion is repeated the apostasy is repeated the people are a sad mess of a failure repeatedly and you read that book of Judges the very last verse in it says everyone did what was right in his own eyes you know why they were in such a mess (laughs) Because they did what was right in their eyes. You know why America is in such a mess? <laughs> because people are not doing what is right in the eyes of this book right here. They're doing what is right in their own eyes. And I, I'm not getting on a soapbox this morning. I forget our internet audience. I do apologize for you guys that are out there. Um, we did a survey one time, well, not a survey, we, we kept up with statistics. Within, I think it was a five-week time, there were 20,000 people that had visited our church website. And Jason told me the other day, there are 700, right at 750 people that have the Carmel app downloaded on a mobile device of some kind. So people are getting the word, uh, and people are hearing the word. But... Okay, now why did I just say all of that? <laughs> I was going somewhere with that. Yes, thank you. <laughs> why, <laughs> why are we in the shape we are in in this country? And, and I'm not on a soapbox here this morning. I'm not. Anyone is welcome to this church. Uh, I don't care if you're gay. I don't care if you're lesbian. I don't care if you're L, B, G, T, Q, R, X, Y, or Z, or whatever it is. You're, you're welcome here. God wants to help everybody. God loves everybody. Uh, Black people are welcome here, white people are welcome here, red people are welcome here, yellow people are welcome here, Uh, gray-headed people are welcome here. We even let bald people come here. So we don't discriminate against anyone. (laughs) But how desperately we need the Spirit of God to come again. People are believing things this day that are not truth. I'm talking about people that sit on a church pew and have sat on a church pew for years. Sit sit in a service every week. They are faithful to church. Jason shared with me the other day a post, and this is not Hollywood, this is not New York, this is not Miami, this is not another country. This is in the Bible belt of this country. And I watched it as the pastor said, And we could get in a vehicle and drive there and be there in a very short time. It's a large church. The pastor said, we're realizing we have misinterpreted Scripture all these years. 
we realize that the Bible was written over 2,000 years ago and the times have changed and we really should have been changing the scripture with the time. There, there's a pastor telling this and said, we're having a conference this weekend at our church to help enlighten people so people can understand and know what's real today. And they were having a guest speaker come in who lives an alternative lifestyle to enlighten them to the truth. And again, anybody is welcome in this church. But there is one standard that we have. And it's not what is right in my eyes. It's not what is right in the eyes of this world. It is what is right in the sight of holy God. And how, <laughs> how we need, the church needs, how we need the Spirit of God to fall one more time and show us right from wrong. Show us what is holy and what is unholy. Show us what is acceptable in the sight of God and what is detestable in the sight of God. We don't need the teaching of man. We don't need a new, we don't need, we need the Spirit of God to fall one more time. The Spirit of God fell and Asa had a word and it changed him and he brought reformation to Judah in that day. Oh my Lord, how we need, how we need, how we need the Spirit of God to fall. Notice how many times there's a reference to the Holy Spirit coming on the scene in the book of Judges and raising up a deliverer. It was the darkest days of Judah's history, and the Spirit of God would show up. <laughs> what does that tell us for today? We're in the darkest days we've ever known in this country, in my generation, but still the Spirit of God wants to show up. Still, the Spirit of God wants to be poured out. Still, the Spirit of God wants to reveal Christ and reveal truth. Notice how the Spirit coming upon someone is always a call to action. Every one of these people, the Holy Spirit came on them. What did they do? <laughs> well, I better find me a comfortable place in here to sit down. I sure hope they sing my song today. I ain't going to worship if they don't. Oh, sorry. I thought I was somewhere else for a moment. <laughs> Every time the Spirit of God came on someone in that book of Judges, it was a call to action. It was a call to confront the enemy. It was a call to destroy the powers of darkness. Mm. Jerry, you're not in Brooklyn. Calm down. <laughs> the New Yorkers get a little wild. We think the Spirit of God coming on us is for us to shout in here and us to feel good in here and us to have doodaddies in here and us to speak in tongues in here. It's a call to action. It's a call to get up and go out these doors and change that world around us. It's a call for us to get up off of our seat and get engaged in the battle. It's not by might and it's not by power, but it is by His Spirit. Greater is He that is in us than he that is in the world. And we need to take what happens in here out these, out these doors. You're mighty quiet. That's okay. In the book of Judges, the Holy Spirit would come upon people. And he would empower them. Were they perfect people? I don't think they were. By what I read about their issues they had. Acts, you move over to the New Testament. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. In Judges, he just came on people. In Acts, he not only came on them, he filled them. 
He empowered them. He anointed them. Not only did he come on them, he filled them. I, I don't know how to say this. So do I say it and it come out wrong? <laughs> I think we have emphasized a tongue. And I, I speak in tongues every day. I have to. I do it for my mental stability. <laughs> you just think I'm off the rocker now. <laughs> if I didn't pray in the Spirit, there wouldn't be any hope for me. But I think we have emphasized, I don't know, I, the most Spirit-filled man I have ever known in my life told me with his own mouth, he said, I've never had the gift of speaking in tongues. And that was George Seddon. But he was so anointed he was so empowered. He was such a witness for Christ. And I'll take fruit any day over a tongue. And I'm not against tongue talking. You know that. But I've seen people talk in tongues that in the next breath they say some colorful words. I need to get off that. <clears throat> we need the Holy Spirit to fall on us fresh and new. He's not even welcome in a lot of churches. Uh, we have pushed God out of this nation, out of this country, out of... But we need God, and he will come where there's a remnant of people that want him. Let me move on. Number two. Whew, I took too long on that one. An unchanging truth. Verse 2, he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Hear me, Asa and all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you while you were with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you, but if you forsake him, he will forsake you. The Lord is with you while you were with him. Well, wait a minute, Brother Jerry. I thought, <laughs> well, there again, it's not what we think. It's what the Bible says. God is with me while I am with him. What, you mean that I can't just name his name and go out and live however I want to live and do whatever I want to do and just expect him to heed my beckoning call and him to answer me and meet all my need? The Lord is with you while you're with him. Are you walking with Jesus today? Or have you drifted away? Are you walking close hand in hand with him? Or have you left him by the wayside and said, Lord, I'm going to go do my own thing. I think you'll be there when I come back for you. And he's so gracious and he's so merciful, he probably will be. But the Lord is with you while you were with him. John 15, he talked about abiding. Abide, abide in me. Let my word abide in you. Abide, abide, abide. If you seek him, he will be found by you. The greatest promise we have in this Bible is that if we pray, he hears us. If we call on him, he hears us. If we seek him, he hears us. If we, just, if we will just call on his name, he hears us. Why do we live so far beyond what God has for us when he says it's yours? I have a banqueting table prepared. I have a table spread. Why do you live life on your own? Why do you try to do things on your own? Why do you go your own way? Why do you not come to me? Why do you not cry out to me? Why do you not look to me? Why do you not seek me? He said, I promise to answer you. I've promised to meet your need. I've promised to hear your cry. He said, just knock. He said, just ask. He said, just seek. Well, Brother Jerry, that's just too troublesome. That just takes too much time. That takes too much effort. If we seek him, he will be found. If we forsake him, he will forsake us. This nation was founded on this book right here. And have we not drifted so far away? Have we not gotten off course as a nation? And we wonder why things are happening in this country. How many have walked away from Jesus? How many people have been at this church at one point in their life? Hands raised, tears coming down their face, worshiping the Lord. And something happened in life, and they've just walked away. 
The idea that we can live however we want to and expect God to answer our every call, that's not found in the Bible. He said, if you walk with him, he'll walk with you. If you forsake him, he'll forsake you. Verse 3 paints a picture of life without God. A long time Israel had been without the true God, without a teaching priest, and without law. Wait a minute, this is God's chosen people. This is the people he hand selected. This is the people he hand picked. And it says they've been without the true God, without a teaching priest, and without the law. Romans chapter 1 is a sad commentary on the results of living a life without God. This nation, we are reaping today, we're beginning to reap today a full harvest of what it means to turn God away and say, we don't want you. We don't want you in our midst. We, don't, we want to do our own thing. We want our own rules. We want to live the way we want to live. And he says, fine, I'll back away. Because if you don't want me, I'll go somewhere else. Life without God. Think of the churches that are without the true God, without a teaching pastor. You don't have the best one, but the word of God goes forth from here. I hear from so many people, and I'm not just saying that, we don't get the word anymore. We're not getting the word anymore. How do we think we can survive without God? Verse 4, his mercy never fails. When in their trouble they turned to the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found by them. This is his people that have turned away from him. This is his people that have started worshiping idols and started having this crazy religion that they did all kind of crazy, weird, evil stuff in. And they neglect the true God. But his mercy never fails. When in their trouble they turned to the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found by them. Has anyone ever burned you? <laughs> Some of you are scared to say. <laughs> but, you know, you get burned more than once and you're like, ooh, I'm not going to have anything to do with that person anymore. Are you glad God's not like that? Because every time... They'd turn away and just do their own thing and serve their idol and worship their idol. Hard times would come. Then they'd fall on their face. Oh, God, forgive us. Lord, we, we repent. Lord, we repent. And he heard their cry. And he'd come back right and rescue them. Are you glad God has shown you mercy? Are you glad God has redeemed you and ransomed you? Verse 5 is more consequences of life without God. In those times there was no peace to the one who went out, nor to the one who came in, but great turmoil was on all the inhabitants of the land. No peace to the one who went out, no peace to the one who came in, but great turmoil. How do people think they can live without God? <laughs> he says there's no peace because he is peace. If you don't know him, you don't know peace. And so all this turmoil, all this confusion, all this chaos is going on, and God is sitting in the heavens saying, you've turned me aside. You've rejected me. You want nothing to do with me, and so you're doing things that are right in your own eyes, and there's trouble, and there's distress, and there's heartache, and there's problem, and there's problem, and there's problem. That God never overlooks when someone turns to him. He was found by them. Moses was warning the people in Deuteronomy what would happen to them if they forgot the Lord when they entered the, the promised land of Canaan. He said, the Lord will scatter you among the people. You'll be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. And you will serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart, with all your soul. When you're in distress and all these things come upon you in the latter days, when you turn to the Lord your God and obey his voice, for the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not forsake you, nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant of your fathers, which he swore to them. He said, I'm going to turn to you when you cry out to me. 
But wait a minute, God, they've rejected you. God, they've turned you aside. God, they've done this, they've done that. And thank God for his mercy today. This is the part I wanted to get to right here. Verse 6. When mercy doesn't look like mercy. Verse 6 says, Nation was destroyed by nation, city by city, for God troubled them with adversity. Nations were destroyed, cities were destroyed, because this gracious God in heaven troubled them with adversity. Wait a minute, Brother Jerry. God brought adversity. This loving God who blesses, this loving creator who shows mercy and grace and compassion, he brought adversity. He brought heartache. He brought hardship. He brought trouble. Oh, there's got to be a misprint in there. That can't be right. I mean, God only wants to bless. God only wants to prosper. God wants your doodlebug to become a Cadillac. Anybody know what a doodlebug is? <laughs> Volkswagen. <laughs> God wants your seed faith to grow into this huge tree with money growing all over it. Or does he? God brought adversity. What happened to the God of blessings? What happened to he daily loads with benefits? Well, he does when you're walking in relationship with him. I have a friend, somewhat of a friend. He and his wife live in Mariana. Godly servants. I've been in church, served the Lord. Just such a gracious spirit about them. Just, a matter of fact, saw both of them yesterday at one of the funerals. <clears throat> I've served the Lord for years. Been faithful in church. They have a daughter, a young daughter with a family. And she grew up serving the Lord. She grew up in church. She grew up in a youth group. She grew up knowing Jesus, loving Jesus, serving Jesus. And uh, she married a fellow that was not a churched individual, uh, didn't know the Lord. And that usually is not a good outcome when that happens. And the wife pulled away. And her relationship with the Lord got left by the side of the road. And David, the dad told me, he said, we, we've been praying, God, whatever it takes. Amen. God, whatever it takes, don't you leave our daughter alone. You get our daughter's attention. God, whatever it takes, don't let her be lost. God, don't let her go to hell. God, you speak to our daughter. And the daughter is an athlete. She's an athletic type person. She's a runner, runs in marathons. Picture of health. She had a urinary tract infection, went to the doctor. Elizabeth knows who I'm talking about. Went to the doctor and got on antibiotics. They did blood work, did a battery of tests, and oh, it's just a UTI. You'll get over this in a few days. Uh, she kept having issues. She went back to the doctor. Uh, her husband found out she had not eaten in nine days, couldn't keep food down. And she went back to her, or, well, her husband said, We're going to the ER get in the car, we're, we're going to the ER, something's going on here. Uh, they got her to the hospital in Atlanta, it was full-blown leukemia, the worst kind that you can have. And then that mom and dad said, we've been praying for God's mercy, however it comes. Mm. <laughs> we've been praying for God's mercy, whatever that looks like. And sometimes God allows mercy to come in ways that we don't see it as mercy. But hear me this morning. Anything, anything that causes you to fall on your face and say, oh God, forgive me, have mercy on me. God, I've abandoned you. God, I've done my own thing. I've gone my own way. It may not be pleasant. And it may not be peaceful. And it may not be what we want. 
But there's a loving heavenly father seated on the throne who wants people to come to him and know him. And he goes to great lengths to display mercy. He goes to great lengths to extend loving compassion and care and kindness. And whatever form that has to come in, if it causes somebody to fall on their face and say, Lord, be the Lord of my life, let me tell you, it was mercy in disguise. One of the godliest women I have ever known in my life used to sit on the back row of that church and intercede the entire service. I could see her speaking in tongues. She had a daughter who was raised to know the Lord. And that daughter walked away. And that godly mama started praying, God, whatever it takes. God, whatever it takes, you get her heart. The parents, you be ready. <laughs> you be ready when you're to the point where you can pray that. God, whatever it takes. And this daughter came down with cancer. And she surrendered her heart to the Lord. And God took her to heaven. It didn't look like mercy at the time, but it was mercy. It was just packaged different than we would look for mercy to be packaged. So let me tell you this morning, parents, grandparents, husband, wife, you've got that family member that doesn't know the Lord or has walked away from the Lord. You start praying for God's mercy on them. Don't you pray that God will just bless them and God will keep them and God will watch over them. You pray for God's mercy. And don't be surprised when that mercy shows up in a different package than what you thought it might show up in. But God has their best interest at heart. There are times when mercy doesn't look like mercy. Oh, no, 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 no. But the... Hmm... <laughs> The Lord says, do you trust me? Do you trust me to do what I need to do in order to reach your loved one? Do you trust me to act in ways that only I can act? Do you trust me with my mercy today, no matter what that mercy might look like? For I want your loved one drawn to me. I want you drawn to me. I have gone to great lengths already. I allowed my son to hang on a cross suspended between heaven and earth. But I will also go to great lengths as well that all people might be drawn to me. I will show mercy. I will show compassion. You might not see it as that at the time, but I assure you I have the best interest at heart. Will you commit them to my care? Will you call on my mercy this day for your loved one, for your family, for your marriage, for your home, for I I will show you mercy and I will show you kindness. I am your heavenly father who loves you with a love you cannot begin to comprehend. Allow me to move and work and give me the freedom to do that and give your people to me. Give your loved ones to me and plead my blood over them and I will work in ways that you are not able to. But do not question how I do it for I will show mercy in the way that I show mercy today. The Holy Spirit speaking with the gift of tongues and interpretation. Sister Claudia, would you come? I didn't finish this, but I think we...
probably got far enough. As Claudius coming, verse 7, I'll just finish. He said, but you be strong. Do not let your hands be weak. Be strong. If there's ever been a time where we're going to need the strength of the Lord, it's the hour we're living in now. <clears throat> and if you go to chapter 16, the very next chapter... It's phenomenal what happens in this life of Asa. This man who was so moved by the prophet speaking to him that he brought about all these reforms in Judah in that day. He brought about a, a, a Jesus revolution in the Old Testament, if you want to call it that. It was a reformation. But in the later years of his life, he turned from God himself. So it doesn't matter that I've had an experience one time with the Lord in the past. Where am I right now today? It's a daily walk. It's a daily relationship. It's not, well, I remember 35 years ago I knelt at that altar. Did you kneel yesterday? Did you kneel this morning? 2 Chronicles 16 and 7 says, And at that time Hananiah the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, You have relied on the king of Syria, this guy who at one time was so reliant on the Lord. <laughs> he put total faith in God. God, you can do it. God, we're looking to you. God, destroy these idols. And then something happened in his life. He got his eyes off of God, and he wanted to reach out to Syria for help. And God says, Why have I not proven myself to you already you that you would reach out to a king you've not relied on the Lord your God therefore the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand were the Ethiopians and the Lubam not an ar a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen yet because you relied on the Lord he delivered them into your hand he said, Asa, there was a time when there was an army greater than yours coming against you, twice as big as yours, and you relied on God, and God took care of them. He said, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. And this you have done foolishly, therefore from now on you shall have wars. And notice verse 10. Asa was angry with the seer. Asa didn't like the message that day. He didn't like the preaching that day. He didn't like what the preacher had to say. And he put him in prison for he was enraged at him because of this. And Asa oppressed some of the people of that time, at that time. This same guy who just in a previous chapter was doing all these spiritual reforms and getting people to turn back to the living God. Something happened in the later years of his life and he quit looking to God and he just became a casualty. Friends, you hear me. If you don't get anything else, it's a daily relationship. It is a daily getting in this book right here. Well, Brother Jerry, I've read that Bible. Well, you better keep reading it. It is a daily building an altar and praying to this God. It's a daily walk. I thank God for what he's done in the past. God's not in the past. I thank God that he's touched me in the past, but I can't live in the past. This is the day. Today is the day. Lord, have mercy. And he does, even when mercy doesn't look like mercy. Could we bow our heads? Oh, Lord, we need you. Lord, we need you. Lord, we need fresh mercy today. Lord, 
Probably every family represented here today has unsaved family members. If just our unsaved family members were saved, this building couldn't contain the people, God. How we need mercy to fall today. How we need the Spirit of God to come upon us today, Lord. God, there are people sitting in churches that don't know truth anymore. Don't know what's right and don't know what's wrong. God, would you intervene? In mercy, would you intervene? God, would you do it one more time? Would you let a Jesus revolution happen one more time? Oh, Holy Spirit, (laughs) fall fresh on us. Holy Spirit, fall fresh on us.